This video is part seven of our series on nerve entrapments. The focus on this video is going to be the C6, C7 nerve root, and I'm going to cover the following. The function of the nerve, the location of the entrapments, clinical signs of this nerve entrapment, how to palpate and locate the dysfunction, and lastly, tips and strategies to effectively treat it. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Matt Maggio. I am a soft tissue injury treatment expert, specifically for neck, shoulder, elbow, and wrist pain. My focus is on finding and fixing scar tissue and then reducing inflammation from chronic injuries without the use of drugs, injections, or surgeries, which does lead to a significant increase in overall functioning and long lasting pain relief. I'm also the creator of the Peak Method and the founder of the Soft Tissue Treatment Revolution, where we teach overworked massage therapists a better treatment system that will allow you to cut your treatment times by at least 50% so you can stay healthy, avoid that dreaded burnout and help a hell of a lot more people get out of pain. All right, Nerve Entrapments Part 7. If you haven't watched any of the other video series, I will link it up on top here if you're consuming that on YouTube because some of the videos all build up on each other. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, it'll be down in the description box below. But want to get into the C6, C7 nerve root. So I've talked about this on the past couple trainings. Whatever the lower uh, nerve listed is the nerve that comes out. So this is going to be the C7 nerve root. So motor function of the nerve has several different functions. Number one is straightening out the elbow. Next one is lifting the wrist. Another one is elongating the fingers to an outstretched hand. So basically here is a hand is stretched and reaching out and the, um, lifting the wrist just like that. And it also controls the triceps in uh, the upper arm, especially up top in there as well. So it has a lot of motor functions for this nerve. Sensory function of the nerve. So this diagram over here really shows where some of that pain distribution will go. A big thing that I always teach in my trainings and my clinical practice is always the idea of asking lots of questions for the client. You want to know where it hurts, but what does it feel like and kind of tracing everything as well. You know, a lot of people just really focus in on one data point and you can see over here, there's a lot of different areas where this C7 dysfunction can radiate a lot of pain. Uh, a big area that gets missed a lot is down here in that mid back area. I'd say like from like T1 to T4, most people think that's like a rhomboid problem or like something deeper down there. A lot of times it's a referral pain from a nerve entrapment higher up. And then it kind of follows this classic uh, referral pain down the back of the neck in here, down into the posterior part of the shoulder, into the tricep and see how it works. It's all the way down into the hand as well. So it controls a lot of sensory areas from the upper extremity and knowing exactly where they feel that pain, especially the type of pain. We've talked about this in the earlier trainings, like nerve entrapments are going to present with some numbness, some aching, some burning and some tension as well. So really dialing in on your history and not just jumping right in. They're like, oh, it hurts in my mid back here. I'm just going to start working there and poke around and see what happens. You really have to take the time to slow down and collect the data because I always say if you can't find it in the first place, you sure as hell can't fix it. So where does this nerve get stuck? We cover this in the other trainings as well. It gets stuck in the scalene group, specifically in between the posterior and middle scalene where it comes out back through there. So I say this all the time, nerves are built with about 15% of extra slack to kind of work their way through the body and get where they need to go over time builds up, get that scar tissue in there, and then it gets stuck. And the area gets caught the most is between that posterior and middle scalene, just with posture and everything like that. That's an area that gets a lot of friction and a lot of tension. That nerve gets pulled, and that's where it's going to get caught for the most part. And that's where the primary entrapment is going to occur. It can get entrapped as it works its way down, but usually I'm checking a little bit higher up in the neck area because that's where the primary dysfunction usually starts. So why does it get stuck? Same same story every week in all the trainings. Poor and sustained posture. You know, we sit for way too long. We sit for too long. The nerve gets stretched. When the nerve gets stretched, the muscles tighten up. When the muscles tighten up, they don't get enough blood flow. We don't get enough oxygen. Body starts to lay down some scar tissue. Over time, that scar tissue gets bigger and bigger, gets stuck to the muscle, causes those symptoms, burning, numbness, aching, tingling, tension, all those good things that happen in a nerve entrapment. Injury or trauma as well neck injuries, car accidents, whiplash, falls, weightlifting injuries, all sorts of things. And then also some issues just from some past surgeries. When they go in there, say they're maybe someone had like cancer treatment or some lymph node stuff, and they might've got in there and they might've nicked a little bit of that nerve as well. But there's multiple reasons. But the number one reason is just from poor sustained posture. Everyone spends too much time sitting, looking down on their phones, 
causing a lot of issues. And that pivot point right at that C6, C7 is right the perfect spot where that neck is at the most load and the most tension going on in there. So that's where that scar tissue is going to be very common to form. Some clinical signs associated with an entrapment. Number one is going to be pain from the neck radiating down the shoulder into the middle finger, kind of that whole chart that we showed before, it's gonna radiate down. So radiating pain is pain that starts somewhere and works its way down. Next thing is gonna be some numbness in the palm and the index finger in the middle finger as well. You know, a lot of people will just generically say, oh, I got carpal tunnel, I got carpal tunnel. My wrist is tingly, I got carpal tunnel. There's a lot more involved in that. And a lot of times you have to check a little bit higher. Uh, the median nerve actually, Part of its formation does come from the C7 nerve up higher. And if it's compromised up there and you're only treating down here where it's numb and tingling, you're not going to get to the root cause of what's going on. Next one is just going to be some weakness in the upper arm. Like I said, it controls the triceps uh, in the forearm as well, uh, straightening out the elbow and straighten out the arm in the wrist as well. It's going to affect all the motions in that region because it, uh, it is a very big motor nerve and innervates a lot of that. So if there is compromise somewhere higher up in the chain, you're going to see that as well. You're going to see the sensation. You're going to see the quality. You're going to see some motor weakness, all sorts of stuff. We want to put all the clinical data together and form a hypothesis about what's going on. Instead of just being like, I'm going to try some stuff and treat it and see what happens. Why not collect some data, slow down, analyze it, and get yourself in a good place so you know exactly where to go. So you're not spending all this time doing all this extra treatment that's not doing anything and actually making the problem worse. You're working way too hard. You're not getting to the root cause of what's going on. That's why I make these training videos. So how to find it? Uh, palpation, very important. Uh, I talked about these in the past trainings. If you go back to any of the other videos, we go way in depth about the scalings and how to find them. I'm not going to exhaust you on that. Go back and watch that. But basically what we want to do is we want to find it with some landmarks, um, especially where that nerve root is there. You can count up from the spinuses as you go up. I go and find that C7. It's the biggest pointy bone in the neck there and go one up. And then I just go out lateral with my thumb and I find these pointy ones on the side called the spinous process and it lives somewhere in between there. So what we do is we go in there and we're going to feel. And when the nerve is healthy, it kind of bows and goes back and forth. When it's not, it's very tender. It feels like it's stuck. It's literally stuck in there. It's going to be very sore for the client. And the way that I like to palpate it is I have them laying down face up. That's called supine for all you anatomy nerds out there. And then I also take their arm and tuck it down behind their hip. That's going to pull some of that tension and that shoulder blade down so I can really have it pop up and tell me exactly what it's feeling. And we did we did include that advanced palpation in uh, lesson three. The links were all in there as well. You can go back and watch that. It's the same thing. It's just, we showed you a little higher, just going to work your way down as you go. But really getting in there and slowing down and feeling, is that nerve stuck there? Is there a lot of tension? Is it a little extra sore for the client as well? Then you know for sure you're right on it because you've already had all the clinical data. You're like, I'm already thinking that this is a C7, but let's go in there and feel it. So now you have, you know where to go. You go feel it. Now you're putting all these data points together and you're putting yourself in a really good place to get to the exact part where the problem is and you can fix it effectively. So how to effectively treat it? Say this every training all the time, all the people that I train that come from my courses, then come in my clinic, all this stuff, you got to go slow, you got to be precise, and you got to be focused, you know, so many people just go in there, and they're just in a damn hurry, you know, they're like, I'm gonna get in there, and treat all this stuff and just see what happens. You have no plan about what's going on. You're all over the place. And you're not getting real predictable results. I covered a treatment demonstration of this as well in the part three, all the links in that description. A big thing that we want to look at when we're doing this is we want to have proper depth and then tension. In order to break down a nerve entrapment, first we got to find it with the palpation. Then what we need to do is we need to go in and sink into it. And then we back out just a little bit. And then we set some tension into it. The tension is what breaks it down. Then we move the client's head through that range of motion. It's very slow. It's very precise. It's very focused. A lot of people that are novices will say, oh, it's just pin and stretch. No, it's not pin and stretch because if you just hold the nerve down and you yank their head through, it's going to hurt like hell. The client thinks you're doing something. You think you're doing something and all you're doing is jamming that nerve into the bone and pissing it off a lot more. It doesn't need you to kill it. It needs just the right amount of pressure and tension. And these nerves, I'd say anywhere from like eight to 10 ounces of force. That is not a lot of force. We never treat more than about three to five passes on each palpable um, entrapment in there. Don't do any more. 
If you do more, it's actually overly effective and causes more issues. Treatment is like a medication. You want to do enough to be effective, but you can do too much and you can make it a lot worse. And another thing that we add into my own clinics is this idea of load management. So basically, if you think of an injury in the most basic just presentation on one side is load what they do. And on the other side is capacity, what they can take. So over time, load exceeds capacity. And that's when the injury happens. So what we're doing by removing these entrapments and getting the scar tissue out of there is we're improving their capacity. But if they continue to do more load in between each treatment, it's not going to get any better. It's in fact going to get a lot worse. So we do this thing called the postural transformation program. It sounds real fancy, but it's real basic. We teach people how to like Make sure they get up and do a walk in the morning, make sure they're drinking water, how to hold their phone correctly, laying down throughout the day to take breaks, getting their neck in a good place. Because so many clients come into you and they're just like, here's my problem. I'm not going to change anything. You fix it. And you're like, okay, I'll just do it. But it's it's just frustrating. And you're not getting to where you need to be. You're not getting the results that you need to, to have for the client. So you have to find a way for them to manage the load because you can't be with them for the rest of the week. You're there for their treatments and that's it. But they have to do their part as well. And managing that load is going to allow that treatment to hold and last and increase capacity. So eventually they can do more load and get out of that injury. So I got for you guys on these videos. I appreciate you guys sending in all the support and really enjoying this series. I like making them. I make these videos just to get some information out there and make sure people get good treatment. Cause at the end of the day, I think the conservative care model really sucks for treatment. You know, most people end up at the chiropractor who doesn't really do much of anything. And then physical therapy, that's just a bunch of glorified personal trainers, not really getting to the root cause of what's going on. I believe massage therapists that are good at manual therapy can be even better and start solving problems. And they gets to the idea of like thinking critically and figuring out a problem, being a clinician first and then a technician. Second, I uh, appreciate you guys watching the video and share any insights in the comment sections or maybe any epiphanies you have uh, about what I'm training and what I'm trying to teach. I appreciate you guys and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.